what I want to do and what I want to state right off the bat, and I need to more frequently, is let people know that I'm not giving you direct recommendations. I feel like you need to search within your own spirit and realize that, you know what? God's got you covered. Don't freak out. Don't stress out. If you're stressed out, probably if I were to say what would be the number one thing I would be taking if I was stressing out, I'd be taking some California poppy. Stress will destroy your immune system. So just so you know, some of you probably need California poppy rather than any other herb when it comes down to this situation that we're in. Um, what are you thinking you need to do? Uh, I'm just oh, presenter for the slides. So you get the slides up in front of you as I go through the video. You'll also be able to do TWD in the comments on Facebook and get access to the research studies, the articles, those things. I did update a few more research studies uh, specifically towards fever. Um, and I did that because of a new press release uh, in regards to um, the World Health Organization and France uh, even did a, there was an article put out that France said, uh, don't treat fevers with ibuprofen uh, or other um, anti-inflammatory medications, those types of things. So we'll be going through that. Um, because I need you guys and I want you guys to be well informed, but I also want to want you all to realize and see what truly is misinformation and how sad. There'll be some great examples of that. I'll in fact be able to break down how Stanford University researchers actually um, promote the flu vaccine incorrectly with a study in pregnant women. Um, we'll be breaking down that. And the reason I did that was because of uh, just recommendations and links and resources. I will be breaking down some articles. I'm going to break down two articles, probably the two primary. I've gotten three primary sources um, when I ask people um, to send me references or resources or evidence for the claims that elderberry would be problematic for cytokine storm or would be problematic for COVID-19 infections or coronavirus infections. So that's what I'm gonna be break, breaking down. I am gonna pick those articles apart and I do wanna say, hey, I apologize if there's anything negative that would come about towards the, the mothers, the herbalists, the individuals who put out these blogs. Um, they probably in good heart um, and desire to want to get information out there to people, um, but I am going to break it down. I'm not going to say that these people are in any way, shape, or form bad, but I am going to say that the information that is linked to through these articles, these blog posts, is bad. And I'm going to point that out to you and show you specifically why I feel that way. Um, it would be bad advice. Uh, that is linked through, or it's bad information, it's bad analysis, it's bad assumptions that have come about because of people's theories. And then I'm gonna break down some of the research studies. I'm gonna show you the research studies on elderberry, both in human trials and in petri dish trials, that why some people are concluding or assuming that elderberry would be bad for individuals with COVID-19 and the theory that it could potentially cause cytokine storm. And then I'm like, well, give me the references and resources for all these people dying of cytokine storm with COVID-19. And people can't yet get me those as well. Um, so it'll be a lot of information. Hang with me. We'll be going through it. People wanted my short, what I'm going to be teaching you and showing you is if you look at the evidence, elderberry is not an immunostimulator in the way that it's going to artificially rev up your inflammatory immune response without any other aspect. They're not, it's, it feeds your immune system. It is a natural antiviral. It helps you recover quickly. Um, it has tons of antioxidants, has three times the antioxidant capacity um, per weight, as does uh, blueberries. So it helps gobble up and basically resolve a lot of the inflammation and free radical damage and the soreness and the pain that and discomfort that comes along with an immune activation response necessary to clear an infection. Um, is, am I glitching? Somebody else said I was glitching. Okay, cool. Um, Astragalus, uh, what you take to help with tick season, how much to take. Tanya, Astragalus, are you going through ticks? I'm going to talk about that later. 
But thank you, Tanya, for bringing it up. Yes, I have been taking astragalus since we started seeing ticks arise um, with the warmer climates and season here in Clarksville, Tennessee. Um, I'm also burning my fields off. I'm burning the understory of my woods and my grasses. We need to do more controlled fires if we want to go into the tick situation. We need more controlled fires. If you substantially, if you do, and you don't really have a controlled fire, you have a prescribed burn. You prescribe, we're gonna burn this region and that will kill off the ticks and provide poor habitat for the ticks. They die off. We need more of that. That's why we have tick explosions going on. But again, off topic for today. So does elderberry. So here's stuff that I've been getting and seeing. This looks great. Selenium is super important in the virus in C and D. I'm leery of herbs in this time around, even though I usually swear by them. That's that's just, I mean, C and D are great. They're inexpensive. You look at the supplemental benefits of those two things in antioxidant properties of C, the immunoregulatory properties of vitamin D. If you're deficient in either of those, it's bad news bears when you come down with any infection whatsoever. And then here's another thing I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you that there's another infection that causes the vast majority of the common cold symptoms every single year, and it's rhinovirus, that actually has a higher mortality risk than influenza does. But nobody seems to care about rhinovirus, no, because there's no vaccine in the market in the pipelines. So we'll be going through that, but you know what? Those are great, but if you're deficient in other constituents, guess what? You can take all the vitamin D and C you want, but if you're deficient in something else, you, bad news bears again with any infectious disease. Doesn't matter if it's coronavirus or not. But those are cheap and expensive, and I'd absolutely say, hey, that is a great idea to have on hand or be supplementing with just to help support your body. They're very inexpensive, they're very cost effective. So um, we are basically only we're reserving the vitamin liposome and vitamin C and the powdered vitamin C that I have left in office for people that are my direct individual patients in my clinic. Um, we don't have access on land to those things, that type of stuff. Um, it's basically sold out. We do have plenty of vitamin D through the Wellness Way. And if you go through the Wellness Way store, Ashley will link that for you. If anybody does so desire herbs or supplements as we talk about them, I greatly appreciate the um, financial support when somebody purchases through the Wellness Way using my doctor's code. Um, so I do appreciate that. Um, so, because I'm giving you a ton of information, folks, I spend hours upon hours doing this type of thing. So, here we go. Um, why so? I understand that herbs would be, uh, would be a, I don't understand why herbs would be a no-go in a particular virus. Cytokine storm, she says, or he says. Um, that's what is killing people in coronavirus. I'll take my herbs unless I get this and it attacks my respiratory system. In that case, anything that pumps the immunity Again, pumps the immunity is a wrong terminology. They don't understand how herbs actually work. They feed the immune system, but it's not going to artificially inflate inflammation in the body. And in fact, it can reduce inflammation because they're antioxidant capabilities. So pumps the immunity, fuels the fire at the point of C is extremely crucial. All right. So. And again, medicine is going to do more studies into vitamin C and things like that because it's a medical way of thinking. That's a medical, medical physician way of thinking. You know, I'm going to feed herbs because they support our immune pathways in multiple different aspects. Both are inflammatory, that is necessary for the removal of viruses and bacteria and pathogenic organisms from our body. We need inflammation, okay? But we also need a strong anti-inflammatory aspect as well. And we'll show you that elderberry actually supports both arms. And in the study that did the most the, the most number of cytokines, they saw elevated inflammatory cytokines, which they measured four inflammatory cytokines, and they measured one anti-inflammatory cytokine, and elderberry increased all of them. But again, you can only use science that has been done to talk about this type of thing. And that's what I'm going to do is break down the science. So for those who this is another share and quote, um, just pulling these things off Facebook. People have shared with me and said, hey, did you know this? And what's your thoughts? So for those of you and maybe those of you who may be stocking up on items for CV virus. All right. So I have recently read that a friend of mine in the medical field and naturally minded and knows her stuff. She does not vaccinate. For example, that you may not want to use elderberry for this virus or even preparation for it as it may exacerbate symptoms via upregulating cytokines and causing a cytokine storm. This is not 
all right? This is not the first time I've read Elderberry can do this issue when it comes to certain viruses, and this is not the first time I've read it either. I've heard people just say, don't take Elderberry for more than four days. I'm like, well, what about the 12-week study? What about the year-long study? What about the studies in the flu in Panama that actually people took it for more than four days? I'm like, where's people getting it? I can't find one single study that ever showed that more than four, on the fifth day, Elderberry becomes a negative response to your body. I can't find it. Nobody's ever been able to show me it, but widespread misinformation within the natural country world, all right? So again, I get frustrated about misinformation no matter where it comes from. Thankfully, they say, there are other options such as lipospheric vitamin C, selenium, Brazil nuts. I love that they mention Brazil nuts and I would definitely eat healthy. You know, my sister was like laughing because she went to the supermarket and she's like, they're all sold out of like toilet paper and all these clen cleansers and they're sold out of like all the junk food. She's like the ice cream, you know, aisles basically empty and yet all the vegetables you could get your hands on are available. I'm like, hey folks, if you want a nice cheap vitamin C and you didn't get to buy some and everybody's out of stock, guess what you do? You get organic oranges or lemons or limes, you peel them, you juice them, and you peel them, and then you freeze the, the uh, peeling, you blend it first really well, and then you, then you freeze it, and then you use those ice cubes, and you drink that down. Some of the highest antimicrobial beneficial effects from vitamin C in the largest amount of vitamin C comes from the peeling. Yeah, it's bitter, but you know what? That's your medicine. Go with that, free, cheap, and easy, and you get you know, feed your kids at the same time. If you're like mine, they love those organic little, you know, quick and easy peeling uh, uh, oranges. So, bioactive silver, which I'm look more antimicrobial. Yes, there's antiviral effects, but that's not my go-to personally either, though. Um, it is a good choice, though, all right? So, you got Chinese herbs, N-acetylcysteine. She also learned that uh, Dislodge mucus from the lungs, humidifiers, I would agree with that. Burning sage for antiviral effects, those types of things. You know, um, there's other herbs like mullein that I talked about, could be used as toilet paper and an anti-inflammatory for your lungs. She talks about along with oregano essential oil and other expectorant oils. Be careful with oregano oil, it's one of the most antimicrobial herbs, but it can definitely mess up your gut. I see a lot of people with microbial deficiency, so gut bacteria deficiency, when they're taking essential oil, oregano, and ingesting that. I'm more about use the herb in your food than taking directly the oil unless you have a definite microbial bacterial infection. So inhibition of several strains, the Panama study, um, actually helping people. I think this one had the 90% um, were, uh, they said a complete cure. I'm not saying you can cure the flu with or coronavirus with elderberry, but I'm going to read this to you. A complete cure was achieved within two to three days in 90% of those people supplementing with this elderberry versus a placebo. And this is a human trial. This is influenza season though. Okay, the effect of Sambuco, black elderberry, natural product, and production of cytokines. This is where some of the misinformation comes from. And actually, this wasn't the study that was referenced, but if you look at this, it'll actually say that TNF-alpha production was 44.9% higher. Now, you got to understand how this study's done and watch this. This is a junk study to me and this was results way outside the um, other previous studies on uh, uh, inflammatory cytokines. So here's how they did this study. They took the blood from healthy donors, they spun their blood down, they extracted their monocytes, so they only tested it against one type of immune cell, that's it. Not the entire blood, which you need other immune cells to be able to help in regulation of the inflammatory responses. So that's a problem with this. What it do to the immune cells? But watch this also, listen to this. All right, so the cells were suspended in a medium. The supplemented with final concentration of one millimole sodium pyruvate, um, 50 mil, uh, U, or UML of uh, penicillin, 50 milligrams of streptomycin, two mill, I mean glut glutamine, and MM of vitamins, more vitamins, and what are their vitamins? Are they synthetic? What is it? 2% inactive human albumin serum. What? Penicillin and streptomycin? And, I mean, seriously, that is horrible. That, so what if the immune system was responding to that crap? Sorry for using the word crap, but the reality is 
you all should have a bunch of toilet paper. You can clean that up for me. But anyways, it's just, I mean, that is a bad study. Point simple. All right. I had people even say, well, we're going to check with this, this, uh, this herbalist, which I love his books, Stephen Bruner. Um, I believe that's how you pronounce your name, pronounce his name. Um, he broke it down. He said there, his books, antivirals, page 52 to 55. He goes with, he said his tincture formulation would probably look like skull clap, skull cap, Japanese knotweed, which, which if you want Japanese knotweed through the wellness way store, it is re called resveratrol. All right. So Japanese knotweed is so far identified in nature to be the highest concentration of resveratrol. And when you look at Lyme's disease treatment and things like that, they're finding naturally that Japanese knotweed has superior effects to resveratrol isolate. So an isolated resveratrol supplement versus a standardized Japanese knotweed herb formulation. Japanese knotweed was better. Again, whole food herbs, in my opinion, are far better. Kudzu, licorice. We do carry licorice. Um, I do carry kudzu. Um, but those are people that, that I typically work with those herbs more in situations of um, someone dealing with a chronic infection with Lyme. Um, he goes to say decocted elder leaf tincture. Um, Elder leaf. I personally never used elder leaf, so I'm going to be doing a lot more studying on elder leaf, and and I respect this man's opinion, so I'm glad to hear that. But he did say that el the berry would be effective as well, but he felt in concentration that the elder berry, the berry itself, but he says the elder leaf, nobody sells, so you'd have to do that yourself. Um, but again, I've seen evidence of the flower being more beneficial than the elder leaf in its um, compounds, and then the berry for anti viral, I've never read a ton of information on the leaf. That's me personally. He may have had, he's got a lot more experience in the, in the herbal world than I do. So I've got to show respect to somebody who's been in this field a lot longer and I'm going to take, and I'm going to learn from what he's saying. So, and that's what I suggest everyone else do as well. He did say the berry would do, I guess, but it's also one third as effective as a decocted leaf. Doses of three times a day, six times if active infection. He said immune system, cellular protection, cytokine interruption interruption he said cordyceps which is a an adaptogenic mushroom don quai um, i've got studies on ginseng and other coronaviruses i've got studies on um, uh, stinging nettle um, inhibition in coronavirus i've got elderberry inhibition uh, studies on elderberry and inhibition of coronaviruses these are prior strains of the coronavirus, not the new novel strain. No studies have been done to evaluate drugs or herbs against the current strain. We need to be able to establish that. Um, it says Dong Kwai, that is an herb that we carry through the wellness way as well. Um, Rhodiola, Astragalus, um, one of the herbal tinctures that we carry here in office, you'd have to order that directly through the wilddoc.com or our office. Um, and that is our adaptogenic forest folk fungi adaptogenic elixir. Um, has cordyceps, has uh, Rhodiola, and some other, and ginseng. It's more of an adaptogen formulation. So cellular protection, cytokine interruption, um, he says dun, dun shin, uh, red root cinnamon, uh, cinnamon is in our elderberry formula. I would say I'm supplementing and been, and I would probably my biggest and strongest for the preparation and just overall immune system strength because astragalus feeds your, your bone marrow. Um, it really feeds that component, that source of our immune cells. So I'm big on astragalus. Cytokine storm and avian influenza. I post this article because ultimately I would say if people are saying you shouldn't be taking elderberry because it could in, incite a cytokine storm, well then why aren't people saying the same thing about elderberry in relationship to flu? Because the science does not support that theory. All right, but cytokine storm is a problem and you want to enable our immune system to respond appropriately to an infection. Inhibitory aspects of standardized elderberry liquid extracts against viral pathogens and even bacterial pathogens. Being able to inhibit bacterial pathogens and viral pathogens, you know what, that's the problem. If you, that's a huge benefit to things that have um, protective effects and inhibitory effects against viruses and bacteria because the secondary infection risk is really where we get into trouble. Um, beverages, juices, those types of things. You can use it in pies, jams, jellies, and, and, and 
juices. I mean, so it, just for a standard edible beverage, elderberry is extremely safe, extremely safe when it is a food in food medicine. Elderberry flavonoids bind and prevent infection with H1N1. You look at more what the science is going towards is adaptogenic potential of our immune system. The modulating effect of things. They want immunomodulators to treat influenza infection. Now that's what they're trying to develop in drug regimens. Pharmacies or pharmaceutical companies are trying to develop immunomodulators, but guess what? Some of the strongest immunomodulators we have is gonna be our mushrooms. So I'm gonna go with like reishi mushroom, chaga mushroom, turkey tail mushroom. Um, astragalus would be in, considered more of an immune adaptogen. But again, those immune adaptogens. So this is one of the first references right here. Um, astragalus is a supplement, a tea at what dosage? So, you know, for adults, I'm typically gonna do astragalus at a half teaspoon during, during a stronger loading phase and then maybe a quarter teaspoon twice a day and that's off of the Wellness Way tincture formulations. Teas, but you can use astragalus and for children, you know what, I'm typically gonna go lower dosages and things like that. I typically give my kiddos right now and this is my opinion, I'm not recommending that this is what you specifically do. You can't take my recommendation straight from this video. You need to go and seek the care of your professional medicine medical physician. I need to make sure that I mention that because of ridiculousness. You know, I'm sharing information, folks. That's not meant to treat, to diagnose, or to cover up the COVID. <laughs> I don't know. So, but my kiddos, we've got um, one milliliter droppers that fit our bottles. So I typically take the astragalus and I give them two dropperfuls, which is usually about 1.5 milliliters. I may give that once to twice a day. Um, I'll give more of that um, during tick season. I'll continuously give astragalus throughout the tick season. But in this season, you know what? It's a major immune supportive herb. So Cytosorb, this is a product. This is a company promoting their product according to research from the past, but they're jumping on the bandwagon to say, hey, we've got this cytokine treatment maybe in testing, so they want to utilize that. But this is based off of 2017 studies on coronavirus, or coronavirus infections that is related to SARS coronavirus, not the current novel one, but there is application in that. But that doesn't support that, hey, elderberry in petri dish studies increases the production of inflammatory cytokines also anti-inflammatory, but hey, uh, so since coronavirus causes inflammatory cytokine, um, possibly, maybe we shouldn't take it. But that, but most flu deaths are from immune system storm, they're saying. So again, they're, they, why aren't, it's like it's great for the flu, but not for coronavirus. But there's research to both. But here's the deal, here is the deal. The biggest thing you need to understand, it is the health and the function of the person. It's the status of the, the health status of the individual that ultimately would lead to whether their immune system could overcome an infection or they would go into it a dis, distortional state of an immune response. That is in cytokine storm. That is immune system storm. It's when their body can't regulate appropriately. So then it goes back to proper support for proper regulation, all right? Cytokine Storm, this was a Natural Medicine Mamas. I actually liked their article. That was really, really good for the overall perspective. They gave some kind of uh, level-headed um, breakdown of things, but I am gonna discuss some things that as reading it, and what I do is I don't just read the article, the post, I read the research. And that's what I do with research studies, and I'll show you here in a minute. I don't just take the word of somebody stating an opinion, I read the references for which they gather that opinion and, and perception. So one thing they said, swine flu, H1N1, and bird flu, H5N1, takes control of your immune system. Oh, these, these herbalists, these mamas, guess what? They didn't recommend not taking elderberry. They actually, at the end of their article, said, but this was an article. They actually said, at the first sign of a cold or flu or something like that, we'll take, be giving our kids, we'll be taking elderberry. But people have literally shared this with me saying, or shared it on Facebook saying, elderberry shouldn't be taken uh, during the, flu, the coronavirus, read this. And then I'm like, actually they said, and nobody's, who's gonna go get tested? And be like, I'm not taking anything until I figure out whether this is coronavirus or not. 
Are y'all going to get tested and expose yourself to other people that have other infectious diseases? That's the best way to get secondary infections and wind up overwhelming your immune system. So they mentioned the H1N1, H5N1, um, immune system causes immune system confusion. Um, they reference Wikipedia. I disagree with referencing Wikipedia unless you're going to break things down and read the original references. They say that some analysis, some analysis have, uh, have shown that the virus particularly deadly because it triggers cytokine storm, which ravages the immune system of younger adults. There was one, one single reference for that claim in Wikipedia, but that was the claim they use in the article to say you shouldn't take elderberry. Elderberry might not be the best option, but then the next two sentences literally say what I believe and I feel is the primary cause of the increased death rates. In contrast, 2007 analysis in medical journals from that period of a pandemic, that period, 16 and 17 sources. So there you get two sources there found that the viral infection was no more aggressive than previous influenza drains, strains. Instead, it was severe malnutrition during war times, overcrowded medical camps and hospitals, and poor hygiene promoted by bacterial, promoting bacterial superinfections, and superinfections killed the majority of vic victims, uh, typically after somewhat prolonged deathbed. So and so there's four references to support that it was malnutrition and overcrowded concentration camps, medical camps. This is the perfect environment for superbugs to be generated. You can have normal, healthy bacteria that can become deadly and pathogenic to you and I if we're severely weakened. And especially in environments where it's basically like you put people in. Why do we have chicken, major chicken factories and hog factories and cow factories that are confined feeding operations? And we see increased infectious disease deaths when these infections don't affect free range cattle out there in the wild, or not, not in the wild, but out there in grazing pastures in a healthy environment, not cooped up. This is a cooped up environment that causes superbugs. That is the primary cause of death, along with the use of paracetaminophil and fever reducers. And there are studies all the way back to the 1800s in the British Medical Journal that warned against the use of fever reducers during infectious diseases. And still today, World Health Organization and, and Swedish medical experts are ad advising people take fever reducers at the first sign of a fever. And we're going to break that down. Bad, bad advice. I'll show you the most recent meta-analysis, largest evaluation of the available science on fever yet in this presentation. You will see it in what it say. It shows the most accurate data shows you take and reduce a fever, whether it's manual by cooling it off with a coal rag or, or letting a kid run around without their shirt on or something like that, cooling them down with a fan or, or a cool bathtub, or even giving them drugs increases the risk of dying. And that's confirmed in both animal and human studies that it, fevers are actually beneficial for survival, but the use of medications. They say immune system becomes a runaway freight train where high fever, no, the highest fevers, 104. 40 degrees Celsius had the highest survival rates in this current available medical scientific literature when they were caused by infection, but that's not so if they're not caused by an infectious disease, such as a neurological health problem, a stroke, a, a um, neurological disease where the body is unable to regulate, okay, or a head trauma. You need to cool the body in those situations, all right? But they do note that fever reducing medications don't, Tylenol and et cetera, don't actually reduce fever in the state of a neurological disruption, head trauma, et cetera. So they say fever, they're, I, I, so that's bad, bad information. Fever alters and supports and improves our immune system article there. Most of the 25 million people who died in the 1918 flu was died from cytokine storm. Wow, that's good information to know. You don't want to. And that link they have right there in this blog, that goes to Wikipedia. Bad, not, 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 not cool in my book. I mean, that's stupid in my, I mean, Wikipedia, anybody can alter it. And the majority of references said it wasn't cytokine storm, that the flu in 1918 wasn't more pathogenic and deadly, but it was the overcrowding and malnourishment that caused the majority of deaths. And that isolation, those concentration basic, like concentration camps, quarantine camps, would kill a lot more people if we allow that to happen. 
they will never take me away to quarantine because my stress level would go way up, my immune system would go way down, I'd be in an environment of people who are allowing for viruses and bacteria to mutate very, very easily because they're sick already and we'd be passing things back and forth and that is exactly why medicines over scare tactics is gonna lead and has led to more people. Dragging people out of their homes in Wuhan, China and putting them into isolation camps and quarantine, that was a major factor in the increased risk of death. And that's a fact on it. However, if some, uh, someone in your care, including yourself, gets worse and ill, keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse, you could be feeding the problem with the herbs you are using. I would agree with that. That's not saying elderberry is gonna be the one doing that, but it may be in your situation. People can be, you can be sensitive to an herb while somebody else would massively benefit from the same herb. You need to know your own body. You need to listen to your own body. And I would agree with this. One of my greatest mentors literally told me when treating spinal conditions, this was he, what he was relating it to in chiropractic care. You know what? If you're finding yourself in a hole, stop digging. Stop doing the same thing over and over. And if that's what you're being, you're treat, the way you treat, then you're not treating well. You need to change what you're doing. You need to listen to the body. They go through herbs, turmeric, yarrow, um, cayenne, uh, garlic, horseradish, raspberry, skullcap, St. John's wort, tea tree oil, vitamin C. Those are all decent, but the evidence for those being antivirulent to coronavirus really isn't supported here. They are more of an anti-inflammatory. Gar garlic probably has some of the best anti-inflammatory uh, antiviral antimicrobial properties. Um, again, I wouldn't worry if I didn't have any supplements in my house because I'm feeding my kids right and I'm feeding my wife and me right, you know? I'd go out back and also the freak out about st storing up foods. Luckily for me, I know not everybody else in this situation, but it's growing season, folks. My garden's looking lush and green. I can go out and make all the salads. I could never eat all the salad that God is producing in my woods right now. I've got stinging nettle, which has also been found to inhibit the virus, uh, coronavirus in animal studies. They say now we want to stop taking if the illness is starting to escalate. If the illness is starting to escalate, which I would disagree because how are you judging escalate? That's important to understand. Elderberry, echinacea, honey, chocolate, colloidal silver, kimchi. Kimchi, really? Really? No, it helps you. Yeah, I just, yeah, so some of this stuff, I, I just, yeah. And if you're taking Manuka honey, don't worry about that. I mean, yeah, if you buy store-bought honey bear honey, yeah, I wouldn't be taking that. I would agree with that. But echinacea and elderberry, I just don't get these this breakdown. Um, just starting to get sick, the risk of cytokine storm is not real. It's okay to use elderberry in first defense, uh, honey syrups, echinacea, and all the other things on that list. So they say it's okay, but yeah, if you're just getting worse and worse and worse, you may want to support with other herbs, vitamins, or supplements. You may want to change what you want. You want to listen to your body, all right? Here's another link about the fever issue that I didn't like that came from this blog. They're, they linked to this article or this healthpages.org, and they said, for fevers that are uncon uncontrollable, un un uh, comfortable, sponge the body with lukewarm water and co not cold though, water. Take acetaminophen, aspirin, ibuprofen, to take your fever down. Do not use aspirin, products that contain aspirin, to children or teens under the age of 20. Oh, really? Yep. They're advising you do what science says, literally a medical page, and I'll show you the scientific study in a minute. That is bogus junk information that leads to the increased death in infectious disease, and I will show you that in the most recent meta-analysis, largest study on fever and fever reducers. Sherry says, how about the people with autoimmune disease? Should they take elderberry? I have no problem with it. I don't know if it's my elixir and my elderberry formulations that I've always used, which always contain reishi, mushroom, which is a major immune adaptogenic, which supports your mucosal membrane immune system, your IgA non-inflammatory immune response. And then on top of that, that has been used traditionally in herbal medicine and Chinese medicine, Japanese medicine, Eastern medicine to help in treatment of autoimmune conditions and rheumatism. So the reality is I have adaptogenic herbs in there. I feel elderberry and I've never seen somebody, I've seen somebody sensitive to it. I've heard of people being sensitive sensitive to it, not wanting to take my elderberry because of past experiences with elderberry. Typically those elderberry formulations are containing echinacea and other 
forms uh, and other herbs. So I don't know. I've just personally not seen it. I've seen autistic children do really well with it. Um, children with autism, I've seen autoimmune, Crohn's, MS, different people not get worse. In fact, I have a patient currently working with who's been taking elderberry regularly and she's not getting the typical pneumonia that she gets quite frequently throughout the season. She's literally like, Thank you, Dr. Dale, for elderberry and convincing me that you thought elderberry would be safe for me to take because during the Christmas season when she's like, I'm literally every single year sick with bronchitis and pneumonia because of my weak immune system with an, and she has MS and colitis and guess what? No flare ups and she's doing better and she's consistently taking elderberry and she didn't get sick throughout the flu season. And guess what? You need to understand that you need a strong immune system, but you need a well-modulated mo immune system. That is key. You want to be able to fight off infection with inflammation, but also you need the arms of your immune system well-fed that control inflammation and resolve tissue damage. So you need to be able to look at that, and that's why combination herbs are so amazing. Go ahead, Ashley, real quick. I wonder if this is part of the problem, too. People are abusing elderberry. They are giving it to their kids as if it were a vitamin. It should not be taken every day if it's not natural. They buy this stuff at the store. So, so somebody said, um, people are, on Instagram, somebody asked a question, people are abusing elderberry. Um, they're giving it to children as if there, it was a vitamin um, and uh, it, they're getting it from a store. And it's and it's not natural. Yeah, there are formulations. Um, I won't go into it too much, today, too much today, but there was actually a lawsuit against one of the major, probably the primary elderberry manufacturer because they tried to create biased claims, unscientifically supported claims, that their elderberry was better than anybody else's elderberry on the market. And they got filed a lawsuit and they lost it for that. So um, for that, I didn't like that they lied, so I wouldn't really support their elderberry. Um, but the reality is there's preservatives, there's glucose, there's sugar, sugar, it's probably corn sugar, those alternative we use. We use natural honey, all right, real honey, not Chinese, you know, glucose sugar honey. Um, we use um, lemon peeling, cinnamon, ginger, uh, elderberry as the primary in the formulation. We use reishi mushroom, we use honeysuckle. Reishi and honeysuckle, honeysuckle's been shown to help save the lives of both humans and animals during sepsis, very effective in terms of sepsis immunocompromised situations and in terms of overexpression of inflammation in uh, immune dysregulation. So we use more immune adaptogens. So the, the opinion that you can't give it to your children all the time, the long-term human studies have not shown any negative effects. So I don't know where that claim is coming from. I've never seen it. I don't give elderberry to my kids. Even my elixir, I don't give that to my kids every day. If they want some, we give it to them like a treat. I don't give it to them every day unless there's an active infection going on. During that time, I'm definitely gonna give it to my kids and I give it to them every four hours on just regular. And I say I don't wake them up at night. And usually it's one to two days and they're over it, no big deal. Whatever they have to fight off. I have healthy children. Yes, we're gonna come in contact with infectious diseases and we're gonna fight it off, but we're still healthy. We're never sick. We are healthy. We have to fight off an infection. Change the way you, no one is sick when they're fighting off a cold or flu if they are taking care of their body and they're healthy. If it's a healthy individual fighting off an infection, it's phenomenal. Can I get honeysuckle without raising bees? Yes, you can absolutely get honeysuckle. It's an invasive weed here in Tennessee. So here in the near like a week or two, probably in about two, three weeks, we're gonna have just massive blossoms of honeysuckle. So um, typically it is the unopened flower. You can use the open flower. The flowers that turn that dark yellow to brownish color, those are kind of starting to oxidize kind of like an apple would. If you see those bright white yellow flowers, those are the best or the unopened blossoms. That's the flower that you'd wanna use in honeysuckle tea or honeysuckle tinctures. So honeysuckle is probably one of the most antiviral. It was the primary Japanese um, Herbal Association, Herbal Medicine, and Herbal Medicine is highly um, regarded as scientific and validated in Japan, and they have some of the best health in the world. They're probably the best and healthiest country in the world with the least rates of childhood illnesses and disease and death. So I would probably take their word for stuff. Um, 
you look at elk, honey or suckle was the primary recommended herb for SARS coronavirus. So I hold that with strong weight. So that's where I go and that's why I love my formulated. And again, I will admit I am, I have a financial bias in this. As I'm talking about elderberry, I sell elderberry tinctures. I formulated an elderberry tincture with the Wellness Way. All right, right now it's out of stock and it will be back in supposedly March 30th around that time and you can start ordering then. So, um, and I do appreciate that, but I'm admitting I have a financial interest in the information that I'm disclosing to you. So take that into consideration when deciding whether what I'm doing here is honest or not. I do that with every single peer reviewed medical study. I look at whether they have financial gain in regards to it and I take that into account and then I look at their past history. Thus, it allows me to say, yeah, vaccine manufacturing drug companies, I'm never believing a dang word you ever say. So, because of the number of times they've lied. Fever and thermal regulation immunity, the immune system feels the heat, the fever response is executed as an integrated physiological and neurological circuitry and confers a survival benefit during infection. We discuss the emerging evidence that suggests that adrenergic signaling pathways and thermal regulation uh, shape the immune system. There is mounting evidence that increase of one to four degrees Celsius in core body temperature that occurs during fever is associated with improved survival and even further evidence of that beyond that. France warns against the use of anti-inflammatory drugs, more important information, like they're talking about ibuprofen and others. Even now this article came out, um, saying the World Health Organization officially recommends avoiding taking ibuprofen for COVID-19 symptoms. But here we go, listen to this. The effect of antipyretic therapy upon the outcomes in critically ill patients, elderly patients, listen to this folks, aggressively treating fever in critically ill patients may lead to a higher rate of mortality. They had to stop after the interim analysis. In the middle of the analysis, they had to stop the study because so many more people had died if they were treated with antipyretics, fever reducing, paracetaminophen, acetaminophen, these drugs. The latest 2019 study on antipyretic fever reducing medications comes out and guess what it shows? There's contrasting results, but only two studies showed what they thought was improved survival with antipyretics administration. But that was a study evaluating head trauma, neurological problems, any type of um, administration of it. But in the fever group due to infectious disease, they saw opposite results where it was negative. So you have to read even the studies that they say. It again, you have to understand where it's applicable, where it's not applicable, and you have to break down that information. Results also demonstrated, they said that the major, that, but while several studies, so in essence, I haven't read the other one study. There's two studies that said improve survival, one of which was only improved survival in things that were non-infectious diseases. So you eliminate that one from this consideration when we're considering an infectious disease like COVID-19 or others, all right? And then you apply maybe one study showed improved survival, maybe one, but I haven't read that one yet, so I can't give you whether it was applicable to infectious disease or not. So. They go on, several studies demonstrate increased mortality risk associated with antipyretics, that's fever reducers, or demonstrate fevers benefit in infection. Fever has a benefit. In fact, they said the highest survival rates were in the highest fever. The people that had the strength in their physiological systems to mount the strongest immune response, a fever, had higher survival rates, folks. That's what the evidence on fever and its effect on risk of dying during infectious disease. But listen to this. The results also demonstrated that health professionals, health pompous windbags continue. And I say that because this is ridiculous because even the American Academy of Pediatrics, I believe it was, don't quote me, maybe I think it was the AAP, um, Pediatric associations said, let kids' fevers write it out. Don't do anything. Don't treat it. But they actually said treat it if they feel bad. But then if you look at the studies on treating fevers and then asking the children whether they feel better, guess what? They didn't see improved quality of life in children and decreased pain and suffering. They actually saw prolonged infections in children given this. 
So professionals, health professionals, continue to view fever as deleterious. So they literally say again, after multiple times saying in the peer reviewed medical literature, medical literature, medical professionals should know this, right? Don't you agree? I, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't. But I can't recommend you not take it. They're drugs that they recommend. I can't recommend you not take the drug, but I can recommend that you learn more than what health professionals know. The scientific evidence time and time again says fevers improve survival. But health professionals, according to the latest studies on the effects of fever reducers, say it, the majority evidence says it increases the death risk. And health professionals still think a fever is bad for you. So that basically proves health professionals aren't health professionals, and it proves that we need to get this type of information out to people. The evidence does not currently support routine administration, yet the article in the World Health Organization says, take paracetaminophen. Immune promotes immune cell trafficking, or fever promotes immune cell trafficking and recruitment to areas of tissue damage for essential for surveillance, host defenses, lymphoid organs, increase in body temperature, fever associated with improved organism survival. Uh, in the meantime, this is the World Health Organization and these medical professionals. In the meantime, we recommend using paracetaminophen and, I, and not ibuprofen and self-medication. Um, that's important. But yet the latest peer-reviewed medical literature studies say that's wrong, you are wrong. They're not using science. They're using their opinion on what they want to sell, trying to look like they know what they're talking about. Prescribe, and again, don't just take my opinion for it. You can get all the sources, references, read it for yourself. You need to make an educated, informed decision for yourself. That's why I'm giving you information that calls into question claims like this, given if this is true that the, the most recent published studies looking at all the available data on fever reducers and infectious diseases, and it says the body of evidence, the majority says it would increase your child's risk of dying. Guess what? I want parents to know that and take that in consideration. And when it says that fever actually promotes survival benefit, that's what the evidence showed. Guess what? Medical professionals think fevers are bad because they don't understand how the body works. Also in here, increasing physiological demand during pyresis are identified as potential detrimental health effects. So this is an argument for people from the medical professional profession and scientific community saying that fever may be detrimental. Here's their argument. Because it increases physiological demands. Duh, your body needs more oxygen and energy to be able to produce a, a up regulation of the temperature. That's why I get in a warm bath with my little girl and my little boy. You know what, I get under the blankets, we go and we lay down and we cover up and I let my body temperature help their body temperature increase. I bundle them up in warm clothes or in blankets. I start a fire, I get them in a hot bath or a hot shower. That takes a energy necessity, a physiological demand of increasing the thermal temperature off their body and allows them to recover faster. That's why giving a heat lamp to lizards helps them survive infectious diseases. That's why not shaving the hair off a ferret. If you got a ferret, don't shave their hair if they've got an infection. Clinical trials, animal trials on fever reduction with drugs or shaving the hair off a ferret increases the risk of prolonged infection and death. So please don't shave your ferrets, all right? God bless the ferrets, all that have been sacrificed in the name of proving that hair is necessary. Warmth, a coating, yeah, it's good for you, all right? But here's their, and now, let me give you an analogy for this. So it, 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 yes, it has more need for more energy. That's like saying there's a lot of physiological demand placed on the body um, for somebody treading water in the middle of the ocean. So. We tied the hands of these people treading water so that we'd reduce the physiological demand for oxygen on their body, and some reason they all died. Yeah. But we reduced the physiological demand on their body by tying their hands so they couldn't tread water. They're idiots. That argument is idiotic, period. Support the system. Don't fight against what the system needs for a healthy immune response. That is what people need to understand. All right, enough rants about that stuff. All right.
rapid heartbeat, 100 beats. This is another mama blog post that mom, I'm just like, Ugh. I gotta go to even my notes here real quick. Listen to this, all right? If you look up the normal heart rates for children, all right, that statement could freak a mother out. Because the moms are probably going to be, oh, 100 beats per minute? Okay, I want to go check my child's pulse. Oh my God, they have 120. We better get them to the hospital really quick. And yet, newborns, 70 to 190 beats per minute is normal. For one to two years of age, 80 to 130 beats per minute is normal. For children of three to four years of age, 80 to 120 beats, of, uh, beats per minute is normal. Older children, seven to nine years old, it is normal to have a heart rate of 70 to 110 beats per minute. So that 100 beats per minute mentioned by this mama blog is not, not accurate for, for assessing the severity of an infection. Horrible, bad, they needed to break that down. That's all I would ask. Break stuff down, give evidence to support your, your your opinion in that sense, so that people, so it's not my opinion, it's not your opinion, it's gather it off of the scientific literature in science that we have available. Remember, please seek medical attention in the case of emergency, don't avoid medical treatment for cytokine storm, um, could uh, upon you in any of the care uh, because it, it can be fatal. Yes, it could be, but here's the reality, elderberry is not gonna promote that, period. There's no evidence that it can promote that, period. All right, decrease the herbs, the bad guys. I'm not calling elderberry a bad guy. I'm not calling echinacea a bad guy. I'm not calling honey a bad guy, unless it's the honey bears with the plastic and it's not truly honey, all right? I mean, it's just, I'm not calling kimchi bad guy. Sorry, those are not bad guys in my opinions and I don't see science to support them being called bad guys in this situation, all right? So anyways, um, that's my opinion. I know, I know, I know, I know. I probably just made enemies with these, the, the mothers of this blog post. And I, that's not my purpose. I just don't like, even within the, he the natural healthy community, people giving bad information. That heart rate is bad. That could really freak some moms out. The idea that 102 fever needs to be treated, that was in that blog, guess what, that's bad advice according to the research that has been time and time again done, shown, fevers improve survival. All right, when not to use elderberry. This is probably the number one bl m blog that I've been sent for evidence for why elderberry would be bad. So here you go and you'll get those and you can read it in full. Uh, she has stated that abnormally elevated chemokine levels common in pregnancy draw too many white blood cells to the lungs. That's a bad thing in the lungs where you need airspace, getting the flu. So I'm gonna pick this apart. She mentions this research study. So, and this was her source. So this blog author s quoted this about inflammation, chemokines, cytokines in the lungs, and inflammation in the lungs, pandemics in 1918, 57, 2009, carries heightened risk. Actually, 2009, the people with the increased risk were the ones who got their flu vaccines. The highest risk population were people who got repetitive flu vaccines. And we know that because the heterosubtypic immunity is decreased and IgA immune system is distorted because of flu vaccines. But she sources this. This is not the original science. This is Stanford Medicine's article on it, and they do quote from one of the researchers, the author, but watch this. This was in the Stanford Medicine article. So this is some misinformation coming straight to you from Stanford Medicine. Watch, 21 pregnant women, 29 healthy non-pregnant women were exposed to different flu viruses in the lab. The immune cells were obtained by collecting blood samples from the women before and seven days after they received flu vaccines. All right, flu shots are crucial. So in this Stanford Medicine, the primary author says, K, Dr. K says, and they hope that their research will remind women who are pregnant or planning a pregnancy to get their flu shots. Flu, sh flu vaccination is very important to avoid this inflammatory response we're seeing. Now let's go to the actual scientific study that there's K, primary author, who quoted saying, get your flu shot pregnant women. Okay, let's go to the important highlighted facts in this study. They have scientifically increased, or they have 
significantly increased natural killer and T-cell responses to influenza virus compared to non-pregnant women. So pregnant women have a stronger immune response. These differences were present prior to the influenza vaccine and were further enhanced after vaccination. So they saw more inflammation. So enhanced inflammatory response to influenza during pregnancy results in additional pathology in women, pregnant women, providing a potential explanation for their disproportionate morbidity and mortality. So the enhanced inflammatory response that vaccines enhanced is what causes the disproportionate increase in morbidity and mortality. So K is the primary author. K was part of writing this right here. But K says from Stanford, get your flu vaccines. But in her actual study, she is referencing and saying that it literally says the vaccine increases the overexpression of inflammatory immune response. Does anybody else get pissed off at that like I do? Your study, literally, you highlighted significance of the study was the vaccine further enhanced. These cytokine storms trigger a type of, this is back to the blogger, okay? The blogger, see, that's, a, that's a, see, get my issue here, get my issue. This blogger tries to use the Stanford Medicine article, which when you break down the actual science in that, it shows vaccines are harmful to pregnant women. No wonder human trials and placebo controlled trials that I have gone through that were funded by Bill Gates, the only controlled placebo controlled trials in pregnant women showed increase in mortality in not only their infants and in their, their, the fetus, spontaneous abortion, loss of fetal loss was increased up to a possibility of 152%. This was the only placebo controlled trials and there were two of them done, funded by the Gates Foundation. And the other one showed increased mortality in the children before six months in the mothers who were given the flu vaccine. So there's the best available evidence on flu vaccines and here is a physiological explanation for why more babies died to mothers who were given the flu vaccine. So I've got an issue with this blogger's breakdown because are they reading the original sources? All right, I've got to vent a little bit here because this is very frustrating because I want people to have solid evidence and information. It's one of the things that I desire to be able to deliver to you all. TWD in the comments if you want sources for this evidence and information to read for yourself. It will take you weeks to probably read. I mean, it's it, or, you know, one night, 10 hours, you probably get through all the articles that I've got here. So these cytokine storms trigger a type of viral induced sepsis, which is, nope, it's different, which is an autoimmune event. It's not an autoimmune event. <laughs> I'm sorry. Event involving an amped up, an autoimmune is where you're, you have antibodies against your own tissue. That does not occur in cytokine storm. Cytokine storm is overexpression of inflama inflammation, but it's where the body goes out of it, it goes into a dysregulated state. Autoimmune conditions are where the immune system has antibodies directly against your own tissues, all right, and causing fatal pneumonia. Japanese honeysuckle reverses sepsis induced immunosuppression by inhibiting lymphocyte apoptosis. Identification of natural compounds, antivirals, activities against SARS coronavirus, all right? This is a study where you can get multiple different herbs that are listed as potential SARS, corona, or a SARS coronavirus. That is not COVID-19. These are prior coronaviruses that cause severe pneumonia, all right? They, she, the mama blogger, this blogger goes back and saying, um, I don't know if she's a mom or not, actually, so I shouldn't call her a mama blogger. I apologize for that. That was rude. I do. I it just, sorry. Three of the seven cytokines uh, I listed up above are those, the crappy, cherry-picked marketing article mentioned elderberry upregulating. It gets worse for elderberry because researchers found specifically that areas of the lungs that had high bacterial infection, it's bacterial, not viral, also had high levels of IL-6, IL-8, so it doesn't seem prudent to risk exacerbating this. But elderberry has antimicrobial and antiviral properties, reducing the viral and bacterial load on your immune system, thus requiring less response of your immune system. 
that this is bad like analysis. It's not even applicable. And it's bad science they're referencing. So let's look at the actual human trial over a long term and look at some of those cytokines that they are referencing, such as IL-6 or tumor necrosis factor, to say that because elderberry and petri dish studies increase that. And the reality is, folks, your cells, your bloodstream is not supposed to have elderberry injected directly into it. So taking someone's blood and then putting it in a petri dish and then putting berry on it is not actually what happens in your body. You consume it, your intestinal microbiota breaks it down into compounds, selectively absorbs those things, and then your immune cells are fed from it in a, and work better from it. And that's been shown. So let's look at this. So liver and kidney function and other inflammatory cytokine measurements, and guess what? IL-6 didn't even change over 12 weeks. If anything, it may have actually gone down or better regulated. Tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is again a um, inflammatory cytokine that can increase the, or has seen higher levels in inflammatory cytokine storm, went from 15.3 to 10.5, but that was not statistically significant, but all all the, the cytokines mentioned in these other studies by these bloggers to say that elderberry would not be beneficial or could cause and stimulate the immune system too high, the longest study ever done evaluating those showed they actually probably went down, if anything. So again, that is the information people need to understand and see. Chronic exposure to the high but dietary achievable levels of anthocyanins did not lead to clinically significant changes in plasma biomarkers of liver or kidney function. Whereas there was an increase in bilirubin, that was the only level that went up, but it was not statistically significant. It went up by one point. So, um, but again, you take that into consideration. The effect of herbal remedies on the production of human inflammatory, anti-inflammatory cytokines, again, yes, in this Petri dish study, it did increase tumor necrosis factor alpha. It did increase IL-6, but guess what? There were two of them that actually had some decreases in IL tumor necrosis factor in IL-6. There were some of them that had increases in IL-8, increases in IL-10, IL-10 production, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine. So nobody's breaking down that type, all these studies when it comes to elderberry. And that's what you need to be able to make good, base your understanding, your opinion, your discussions, your, if I see people, elderberry is contraindicated for coronavirus. And I'm like, yo, give me some science behind that. And people are like, Dale, why are you hating on me? I'm like, I'm not hating on you. I'm just asking for science. You're claiming something that I disagree with and I'm asking for you to support your claim and then you send me these bloggers and then I break down their own science because I've already read the majority. I read every scientific, I mean, I already had the study from that blogger about the flu vaccine. I already had all the studies on the effects of elderberry on inflammatory cytokines. I had multiple more studies on this than those bloggers mentioned. And I'm not sitting here saying, I'm so great, I'm, good, good. I'm just so much of a better person. I'm saying, what I'm saying here, folks, is I'm trying my best to give you quality information with a little bit of spin and humor and fun, and it does help me vent. So you get a little bit of my frustration with a lot of science, or maybe a lot of my frustration with a lot of science. I don't know. Unexpectedly, higher morbidity and mortality of hospitalized elderly patients associated with rhinovirus compared to influenza virus respiratory tract infections. I just want to point this out there. So in 2017, they did a study, or they did this study, they published it in 2017, that rhinovirus, which causes over 50%, they say roughly 50% of the cold and flu-like symptoms that people get are from a class of enteroviruses called rhinoviruses. The primary effect your sinuses, so your nose, kind of like the rhino has the horn, okay? I guess that's why they call it that. So they kill more than people than the flu does. Nobody's talking about rhinoviruses here. Oh my God, it causes the outbreak of all the cold and flu symptoms, the majority of them are that. We need to close down schools. We need to shut everybody's bars and restaurants down. We need to tell people not to go to their chiropractor. We need to keep people out of church. We can't be going to Sunday school. Oh my gosh, the rhinovirus is back again this year and it kills more people than the flu because it affects weak individuals. And this isn't weak in the sense they are susceptible. 
It's an opportunist, so is the flu. All these infectious diseases don't affect people who are healthy and are feeding their body what they need. So I'm not saying like, I know now it's gonna be like, Dr. Dale just talked about the war rhinovirus on his crunchy page. We better get out a rhinovirus vaccine next year. He's starting the scare process. He's gonna scare people about rhinovirus. Make sure that we get a rhinovirus down the pipeline, uh, vaccine down the pipeline as quick as possible. Actually, there is a couple studies that have been trying to develop a rhinovirus vaccine, but they can't do it because ultimately it doesn't protect against all the unknown number of rhinoviruses circulating right now. And like flu vaccines, even if you were to protect against one virus that was circulating last year, because that's what they make the flu vaccine from, well, you're weakened against all future strains. And your mucosal membrane immune system is distorted and your inflammatory response is distorted. Sambucal nigra, bronchitis virus, and this is in chicken studies, and it saved chickens from having soft shelled eggs. So if you don't want your chickens to have soft shelled eggs, feed them elderberry, during rhinovirus outbreaks, all right? So I will go above and beyond what I probably should, and I will recommend that you feed your chickens elderberry seed this year. That is, a, you can quote me on that, and I don't care if the health department finds out that I recommended elderberry seeds to be fed to chickens this year. So that's a recommendation from me. But I can't recommend you all take any of the herbs that I've mentioned any of the herbs that I've scientifically broken down, I can't recommend that you don't take paracetaminophen, like the World Health Organization's and health experts that believe fever is bad, yet the science I just showed you actually shows that fever is good for you. But I can't recommend you not take those drugs, and I can't recommend you not do what your doctor says. But I can recommend that you better be educated and informed before you go to your doctor, because it seems the scientific evidence is clear that doctors aren't informed on what really allows you to save your child's life during an infectious disease. So, something I would recommend people read, Swiss Propaganda Research, a Swiss doctor on COVID-19. Great references, resources, read up on it. It breaks down the, the idea that they, they're not even doing proper testing. I have a pediatrician as a patient, and she's literally told one of my staff members, she's like, yeah, we can't even get to be able to do tests when people have bronchitis or flu symptoms or anything. We don't even know who's got this stuff. They're far under testing. And no, I would like to say something else. Here's an, a good, you know what? I am going to write a research study that there's not a true increase in COVID-19 um, virus infections because it's just better diagnosis. Because you know, just like what their excuse is for autism. Though everybody, every teacher, every mom, Everybody sees it definitely increasing in autism. That's a pandemic. Neurological vaccine injury, that's a pandemic. Suicide in our children that is increased and can be induced, psychological disorders found in studies can be induced by vaccines. Guess what? Suicide is killing thousands of children every single year. That's a crisis. 6,000 children die every single day, they estimate, from malnutrition and starvation. I said this already in one of my posts. Coronavirus is not, the worry and scare of coronavirus is not because people are dying. It's because people are afraid it could affect them. Let that sink in. Because if people were truly concerned about the lives that are being lost every day from preventable problems, preventable deaths, then we would have been doing something long ago way more than what we're doing right now for COVID-19. We would have been trying to feed people, feed the world. That's why I love what my church and other churches do when they try to feed the world. So what I would say is you wanna save lives from COVID-19 right now, go find somebody who's on the streets, homeless right now, go find a family or a friend who doesn't have the money to feed their kids right now and you feed them nutritious food right now. You buy them a meal. You give them a little bit of money or you go buy a bag of apples or oranges or bananas and you give those people who are in need and we'll save more lives by doing that right there. That, 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 that's all folks. 
So I'll try to, do you see any major questions or anything? Did you find anything about the ibuprofen? I don't take it, but I'm wondering what is the basis behind it? So I didn't include that, but there are studies on ibuprofen. Great question. I'm recommending not taking ibuprofen. There are studies that it weakens the immune system. So again, these drugs interfere with our body's ability to fight infections. Um, what did I miss about elderberry? <laughs> <laughs> what I miss about elderberry, um, that it's not a problem and it's healthy. And there's coronavirus studies in animals that inhibits coronavirus infections and can save chickens from having weak eggs. And it doesn't cause inflammatory cytokine storm. It doesn't increase these. It's not immunostimulatory causing. And I don't mean to pick on you there, um, that, that lady that just jumped on. I'm just having fun here, Heather. Uh, love that you came on. Um, but yeah, go back, watch the stuff. Hopefully you guys find and gather great information from this. Um, again, I am going to shamefully um, boast, and I'm, I know I'm gonna get people that are like, see, that guy, that's why he talks all this junk, and he's, uh. I give out information because if you're informed, I believe you'll make better decisions. And I work my tail off because that's what I desire to do is to help save children's lives, help save your life, help inform you so that you can go out and be informed so well that you can start to save other people's lives. Because it's this distortion of information, it's this lack of understanding is why we're still treating fevers in medical physicians' offices despite the scientific evidence. Now that you're equipped with that, you will go out and save lives. But I have to pay my bills, pay my lights, pay for this equipment, pay for Anthony and Ashley to be sitting here this entire time. I pay salaries. So if you would purchase the elderberry when it comes back in stock through the Wellness Way, the Wellness Way store and use my doctor's code so I can get a kickback for that, yes, that is me admitting I have financial interests in the information that I just disclosed to you. But it is the science that I just gave you that ultimately should lead you to make a decision on whether you would want to use that product or not, whether you would want to make your own homemade elderberry or not, whether you would want to use echinacea or not. And if you need reishi mushroom, if you need chaga mushroom, if you want adaptogenic herbs, if you want high quality herbs, Wellness Way has some of the best for the least cost too. It's insane, honestly, it is. So. Um, I mean, I got it for like two thirds the cost compared to the elderberry that I used to use. Your code's 5231. 5231 is my doctor's referral code. If you go through the Wellness Way doctor store, I've got to be able to feed me and my family. This is what I do for a living. But I want to always have the opportunity and potential to be able to continue to feed you with information that can save and change your life and save the lives of other people, no matter whether it sells a product of mine or not. My primary purpose is bringing understanding. That's what God's brought me here to do. That's what I believe. And also beyond that, I would wanna say, hey, you know what? What I believe fully is that the elderberry, the astragalus, the stinging nettle, the reishi mushroom, all these herbs that I'm gonna be giving to my sister and her family that would help support their immune system through this time so it'll help my sister just, just relax and have a calm about this time you know what? You know what? I would want that for everybody. But what I told my sister today is I said, you know what? I, 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 vitamin C is inexpensive. It has benef huge beneficial effects. But you know what? I'm like, you know what? That's not what I'm going to be supplementing with me and my kids because I'd rather say and rely on what the Bible says, Ezekiel 47, 12, let fruit be for food and leaves be for medicine and that God would provide. So if we were to say that vitamin C was absolutely critical and it was the number one thing we should have on hands compared to God's herbs that he created, well, then that's saying before they were able to isolate and extract vitamin C, um, then, I, then I guess God didn't provide for those people back in the day. But I believe God did. Just sadly, many people didn't know what medicines God had created for that time in their life because oftentimes it's because of the lies of the pharmaceutical companies. And look in Revelations. That's what we're going to be looking at. Is this an end time sign that's taking place right now? I don't know. I'm sitting back waiting, being like, God, you coming back to destroy all the pedophiles and get rid of everybody? Huh? I'd be like, I'm, I'm ready for that. So I can rest in heaven that my children will never be sexually abused by the pedophile rings all over the country and world right now. The sick and corrupt organizations will never harm my children. I will rejoice when I seeth a vengeance of the Lord. Psalms 58, 10. 
I will rejoice when I seeth the Lord's vengeance against evil in this world. Because as a father, I will rest in the assurance that God now has my children 100% safe against corruption. So that's kind of where I stand on all this. I hope that makes sense. I hope you're all blessed with that information. I love you. Please share the truth. Don't just like it. And with that, we will save lives. I think my final thought was this. You know what? When you utilize these herbs, when you take these herbs, all right, don't be saying, ah, man, thank you, Dale. Be saying, thank you, God, for providing for me and my family at every time in our lives. That's what I want you to say. All right, share that truth. Love you all.